Video girls, please go on your place. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, now we come to our uh, next slot. Everything is standing already here. Welcome Lukas Grunwald. He will tell us now something about RFID hacking. He's a really specialist and he will tell you everything. Good, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I hope I can do it a little bit better than the speaker before. Okay, let's get started. <laughs> um, some information. Who of you has an NFC enabled smartphone? One, two, three. Okay. And who of you actually uses the NFC ship? Yeah. Um, let's get you some, some background and why you should think twice and maybe put it into a shield. Um, some, some background information, start with some RFID basics. Um, RFID tags and transponders stands for radio frequency identification. It's really, really small computer chips that run without battery. Uh, there are different types of transponders we have to deal with. Ones are the very, very cheap ones, about a couple of cents. It's called read-only tags for identification of products like electronic product code, cars, toll collect, uh, animals, humans, ID cards and passes and NFC tags. The second class of tags we have to deal with called read-write tags used for simple payment uh, solutions and access control. Very, very popular with hotel rooms. So if you want to break in to someone else's hotel room, it maybe help you with an read-write tag. And then we have this contact contactless smart cards. That's actually microcontroller. It's a small computer with a CPU, with memory, with I.O. interface. Most of them have serial interfaces uh, and microcontroller with radio interfaces. And some of them feature strong cryptography for payment and access. And we will have a look on this cryptography as well. Um, first questions, RFID and privacy. At the moment, there are billions of RFIDs already in use. The amount will rise immediately when RFID and EPC barcodes will be put into widespread. Every single RFID ship is a permanent fingerprint. So every NFC phone, every RFID ship you carry with you gives you a unique electronic fingerprint. Um, and all privacy if issues are ignored up to now. And the only solution today is to deactivate tax and smartphones, NFC devices. So RFID's needs for protection via strong cryptography is one of the main things. Let's have a look on the possible attack vectors. What can be done with RFID tags, how to attack it, and what attacks are actually common and possible. The first attack, we call it passive scanning. On the passive scanning, you have a backend or edge system. You have a regular RFID reader or a second uh, smartphone. And then you have an attacker with his own data collector. And as soon as the legitimate user is using this RFID tag for access control, for instance, the attacker collects the data that's exchanged between the reader and your RFID tag and is able to do evil things with this. And these devices for passive scanning are already out there. You can go and buy a Proxmark 3 and that's actually everything you need to access to every German airport airfield without any control. The second attack, it's called active scanning. Uh, compared to the passive scanning, if you have an active scanner, the attacker is powering the field, so giving the energy to activate the RFID tag by his own equipment. With passive scanning, you are just listening to the airwaves, to the radio waves. With, act, uh, with active scanning, you are the guy who empowers the waves. Like if I put an RFID scanner in one of these exit doors here, I can collect one hundreds and hundreds of private fingerprints from your RFID enabled tags and from your RFID enabled devices. The second called man in the middle. Uh, somewhere between the regular reader and the back end, there needs to be a data channel. Like if you do an NFC payment with a back end system somewhere on the internet, somewhere on your provider site, you might have a secure way between the user and the reader, but what on the way? 
what happened if someone intercepts your GSM connection? What happens if someone intercepts your regular connection on the internet and diverts the traffic to an attack server and the server is running a man-the-middle attack? Um, manipulation of data, very, very nice and very, very common attack. Uh, what you see here is it's called Metro Future Store. And this Future Store was a technology experiment by the Metro Group. And that's a very, very interesting supermarket. With a little bit electronic skills, you can actually play Jesus. And how can you do it? You can turn water into wine and vice versa, wine into water. So if you want to shop, and they have a very, very interesting collection of electronics, like they have the first use of self-checkouts. This means if you don't want to queue in at a cashier line, you can go to a self-checkout, put on a computer system with an RFID reader your products, all the RFID tags into your shopping basket gets collected, and then you swipe your credit card and you're good. If someone is buying like a, a bottle of liquor, a bottle of vodka, of course there's an issue with governing law in Germany. If you come in into the store and you put a bottle of vodka at the self-checkout, a red alarm gets on. Someone from the staff needs to come around and see your ID, please. Check if you are 18 and if not, you cannot use the self-checkout. That's how they implemented um, protection of the youth, so that no little kids can buy their vodka at the self-checkout and no one is uh, listening on it. Of course, there are RFID tags on it. So what you can do with the manipulation of data, you can get a bottle of water. Looks the same, it's about the same amount, one liter is one liter. And then you read out the RFID tag from the bottle of water. You write this tag information to the bottle of whiskey. Now you go to the self-checkout. The self-checkout has some intelligence, like there's a weight station, so if you put your bottle on it, it measures plus minus 100 gram. Is it a bottle, is it a liter, or is it uh, something expensive? But what's the difference between one liter of vodka and one liter of water? Looks clear, same amount, recognition is not working, and the alpha detect tastes water. Okay, now I turned was whiskey or I turned uh, vodka into water and can use the self-checkout. And fortunately for the kids and unfortunately for the privacy, they did it on liquor, on some test products and on all type of age-restricted movies. So perfect mindset to buy age-restricted material if you are able to manipulate it. And then came this huge argument, oh, who wants? to invest, to write a program, to understand the data field, to hack our uh, tax and to manipulate the data just to save 10 bucks for a bottle of, bottle of whiskey or bottle of vodka. And my response for this is, no, we are doing it because it is possible to so that's possible. Okay. The next type of attack you can do is you can do a cloning attack like to have one user with an RFID tag enabled and you just want to duplicate the thing. It means you can clone <coughs> fair tags if you want to change the fair, if you use an RFID ticketing system. You can clone things if you have the Internet of Things and everything is identified with an RFID tag and there's some inventory used. You can just clone the tag and duplicate it inventory. And you can do attacks, it's called denial of service attack, the type of attacks we all know from the internet. And uh, this denial of service attack can use to deactivate tags. Like if you have a shopping system and you go with a black pen and write over every barcode. Just imagine there's a huge system, a supermarket, and you deactivate all the tags in the supermarket. It means at the checkout, everyone needs to go and type in the amount by hand. So it's a denial of service attack against the supermarket. Another nice attack, it's called a proxy or relay attack. Um, imagine there's a high security development center and you want to break in. And for this high security development center, they're using a triple desk encrypted RFID access card. 
highly secure, unable to clone, using challenge response with token and everything. So how to break in? The next time you are looking with someone from this high security center sits at the bar and enjoys his after work drink, what can you do? You just approach him with a relay attack that's on one side an NFC enabled smartphone transmitting the data over the public cellular phone network and on the other side sits the attacker at the entrance door and just tunneling the whole RFID NFC communication via the GF GSM network. So you can even break into from remote by just tunneling the data. The data rate is very, very slow on NFC and RFID. So this means with a data rate less than about 900 kilobits per second, you are able to tunnel it over a ton of devices, even over a small old-fashioned GS, uh, GSM line. The next question is, what can we do with secure RFID, like encrypted RFID, RFID tags uh, that used for protection, where the industry is telling us, oh, the old RFID stuff, it's unsecure because it wasn't encrypted. Now we are encrypting it, so we are sure. Um, a couple of examples. Uh, there's a MyFair, SmartMX and Deskfire, microcontroller with crypto accelerator, compatible with the ISO 14443 standard, used in Germany for public transportation and so on. Another classic case, it's called MyFair Classic. At the moment, the most popular transportation card. Two billion cards are in use. Very pop popular for public transport. Who of you is actually from Madrid? Someone from Madrid here? One. You know you can ride for free your metro. Who of you is from London or knows the Oyster card? Same card, same vulnerability, same easy way to manipulate. So free metro in Madrid and London. But not only in Madrid and London. You can ride for free in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Valencia, Oslo, Sydney, Hamilton, Delhi, Nanjing, Shanghai, Taipei, Kuala Lumpur, Atlanta, Sao Paulo, Houston, Los Angeles, Bangkok, Netherlands, uh, London, Boston, and so on, and so on. So very common for access control as well. The problem with the MyFair card is they're always telling us they're using a pro prioritary crypto algorithm. It means they are hiding information and not telling why it is secure. If someone is reinventing a crypto algorithm, it's a not a good, a good idea. If an algorithm is not public verified, you're actually mashing it up. So what did a friend of mine he got some nice mic microscopes, uh, used some sandpaper, and just opened the ships, and took via sandpaper, and then took a photo layer by layer to translate the structures automatically into circuits. The type of photos you got here, and it's uh, regards to um, FlyLogic, who actually did this, you see from the silicon how the actual wiring on the NFC card looks like. And if you know how the wiring looks like, if you know how the crypto is implemented in silicon, you know the algorithm. And that's actually the algorithm used for this. It's called the MyFair Crypto One algorithm. And in fact, it's a 48-bit stream cipher. The problem you see here, it's called a random number generator. Unfortunately, if you don't have enough entropy and if you don't have a heat source or something, you don't have random numbers. So what's happened? You can do a really, really simple replay attack because they have failed to generate the right amount of randomness and have a very, very simple cipher. So you get predictable random numbers. And at the moment you get predictable random numbers, you got a broken cipher and no security at all. So, very, very simple. First, listen to legitimate authentication. You know the actual state of the cipher. Then, force the same challenge and answer with the same response. And then, you got predictable random numbers. And with the predictable random numbers, you can predict the cipher, you got the key, and you can just manipulate the MyFair Classic card as a single memory card, a single memory RFID card. 
the next type of attacks you can run against high encrypted RFIDs, it's called a brute force. This of course only works with small keys and the attack is very simple. Just try all keys. And if you look for Moore's law, you have a very, very small smart card, not enough power, but is it, this smart card is powered through the radio field, so you can't have a lot of power consumption. Um, <coughs> so MIFA is at the moment a very, very easy target. Cypher is complexly low, enables different FPGA implementation, and FPGA cluster like this, that's, by the way, off-the-shelf equipment. You can buy these boxes in the States with a lot of FPGA clusters. One of this card has uh, 512 FPGAs. And you have a couple of cards here on this device. So you can actually boot force keys with this FPGAs in about 50 minutes. With the newer generation of FPGA cluster, you can boot force a desk key in five minutes. Desk key in five minutes is actual state of encryption. On the other hand, you have a legacy RFID design from 1985, 1981, with hard-coded things. You can't upgrade the cipher because it's hard-coded and you rely your payment process or your access control on it. Of course, you have always this time memory trade-off. I don't want to go into uh, O over N and complexity levels. This is more for the experts here. And the second problem is if you have complete predictable random numbers as well documented, the whole cipher breaks down and you can get the algorithm for the linear shift register just on Wikipedia. Um, next attack. You can try some algebraic attacks. That's a type of attacks that exploit simple feedback structures based on statistically weaknesses. Um, describe all parts of a cipher and then you can solve this equation. That's more crypto theory, theory as well, so we can skip this. And now it comes to the fun part, to emulation. Uh, NFC has a nice feature uh, compared to other RFID tags. Um, the only difference between NFC and RFID is at NFC you have just not only a reader and a tag, you have, it's called a tech emulation. This means the tech can be emulated as well and can be replayed. So you can use an NFC backend for record and replay a unique identifier, or it's possible to emulate a whole hardware, or you can call, it's called soft techs, that's complete emulated RFID systems. One of this off-the-shelf system, system is called Proxmark, that's a small microcontroller, it's about 300 bucks, and with the Proxmark and the antenna, you can clone every access card, access card, uh, RFID tech, NFC tech, to gain access or do some other evil things. And emulation is a foundation for many different higher level attack vectors we will cover. Let's give you an overview about RFIDs with broken or crypt uh, uh, or weak encryption or broken cryptography and encryption. First, MyFair Classic and HiTech, very, very useful for payment infrastructure and even for cars. So if you have a car about 10 years old with a remote control, that's broken. Um, the older Legic ones, very popular for access control, especially in German airports. So to bypass all the security, all the annoying uh, queues, and to go directly from the unsecure side to the air side, that's mostly logic and that's mostly broken. HID, older one, very popular in the US. And with Atmel, with CryptoF and crypto memory for access control and key storage, both Atmel products are actually broken as well. Um, last month, a colleague of mine gave a presentation at Black Hat and was trying, why is someone using Atmel products anymore? Every product, including the TPM, is so unsecure and it's not safe. So, question. Any safe Atmel products around? So far we know, no. Let's come to the fun part. Now we deal with the tech, that's actually the storage, that's actually the USB stick, but what's the payload? What can you put onto this USB stick to get some fun? 
and we call it RFID malware. Um, if you want to attack the backend, like a cashier system, like a parking system, if you want to crash the parking machine, or you want to park for free, no problem. You just need to clone it. Then you can use a tool. Um, we released this tool at the Black Hat 2004. It's called RF Dump. That's a simple hex editor. And with a hex editor, it's like a low-level file editor. You can edit the content of any RFID tag. So it's a simple reader-based solution. You put the RFID tag on it, and you can emulate it. Or you can use SQL injections and other malware. So interesting things, like you want to do a malware injection. Usually, the companies are running a firewall in front of the internet. The companies have strict security policies, like they tape every USB slot. So no one can plug in a USB slot and no one can use uh, the thing. But on the other hand, for immigration, you will see later, you can do funny things. And you just want to inject malware, like a database worm, an RFID virus, or denial of service attack. So you put it on the communication channel of RFID, and then you can actually exploit it. Even you can try to spread the attack if you have a SQL injection. You can try to, try to write the injection on the next text as passes by. At the moment, you pass by, you can enter CRP systems, ERP systems, middleware, and can attack and break into the systems by just using the same exploit, including shellcode for the RFID or NFC tech. Um, as example, there are a couple of tags out there. They actually trigger on an Android phone content that the Android phone is doing a request on a web browser and just downloading an exploit for the Android operating system. So at the moment, you're passing the NFC phone over a prepared RFID tag, your exploit gets executed and your phone gets rooted and you get a root shell on, an, on a TCP socket somewhere on the internet. Um, question, what's happened? Oh, I just put my phone on sleep. So I found a phone, the phone is locked. What can I do? Uh, just send a, send a short message to the phone. As soon as an Android phone receives the SMS, a short message, it activates the NFC stack and gets into the read loop. And now to my speciality, electronic passports and electronic IT documents. What was the design of the electronic passport? Here you see the design goal from the industry. <laughs> heavy use of cryptography, PKI, heavy use of biometrics. We make it 100% secure. And at the moment where I'm, I'm going to hear something is 100% secure, it must be broken. Um, and they want to facilitate and improve the facilitation. Minimize time spent on legitimate travelers and segmentation of low and high level risk tra uh, travelers and minimize immigration time. Oh, sounds great. So what was the design approach? First, security by committee can't never be good. And this was an example. So what they did, they sent out a standard group at the International Civil um, as, uh, <coughs> Aircraft, uh, Aviation Organization, that's the UN group. And they stuffed it with printing experts because all the printing experts know everything about security and holographic and microprinting. They must be good security designers. So then they're, okay, we need cryptography. So they worked on algorithm with some cryptographic experts and no one knows anything about implementation. All this was driven by manufacturers, committees and politics and no one looked at risks and design goals. So as we know, if you have a design and you say, keep it simple and stupid, the design is always good. Because if you have a small, simple design, you can secure it. But the opposite was done. The first problem they faced, oh damn, we want to use biometrics. And usually if you use biometrics, you're using a hash. So if you if a fingerprint of you is taken and putting into a police database, they are not taking the photo from the fingerprint, they are generating, it's called a hash. There are different hash algorithms, 
and with this hash algorithm, they are just looking for specific marks of the fingerprint and compare it to different parts of your fingerprint. So a hash is stored. The second benefit of a hash is, the hash is a trapdoor algorithm, a one-way algorithm. So you can't regenerate the fingerprint out of the hash. If you just store the hash, you can compare if the hash matches and after this you know, okay, this is this person. Unfortunately, most hashes are patented and everyone is trying to push his own patents into a government document. This means for Germany, 18 million patents needs to be licensed for the German ID cards. For Europe, even more million patents. So the solution was, okay, hmm, we can't do a hash because we don't want to pay patents. So we store it as an image. With the image, the benefit is everyone else can later apply his patented hash and search for his local police database. Unfortunately, this image can be used to re regenerate false fingerprints. Because if you store a GIF image of your fingerprint in a passport, you can read it out and you can just print it on a laser printer and with this, this is some rubber glue, you can make a false fingerprint or even a false finger very well. And as we know, compromises doesn't work with security. They did the same for the photo. So even if you, you can now regenerate biometric identities from a foreign document by just printing out the fingerprint and printing out the JPEG photo on a 3D printer. The next, let's discuss some features of the MRTD, MRTD machine Oh, it's MRTD, it's mixed here. Machine Readable Travel Document or SHIP. The Machine Readable Travel Document, also known as Electronic Password, was specified by the ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, and the aim is to enroll it on a global basis. So not every, every country in Europe, not the States, every country in the world should have an electronic passport the next couple of years even third world countries. Um, since 1st of November, we got the new electronic ID. Um, the new benefit of the electronic ID is the data can be upgraded. Now it's not only read only, it's read writable. And the electronic pass passport data is read only. So data can, can be changed via terminal. The eID can be used as ID card and the internet as well some features on the German electronic ID card. They are all the usual suspect data, like the family name, the chip, the serial ID, nationality, date of birth, expiry date, and photo. And who knows what a CAN is, a card access number. Can you imagine for what this, card, uh, this number is good? Okay, another nice compromise by politics. So, the first idea was every of this electronic ID cards gets protected by a six digit pin. This pin can only be entered three times and then the electronic ID card will be blocked. The next thing that happened is the police, hmm, wait a moment. So we can only read the data from your new ID card if you enter a six digit pin? What's happened if you get a drunken driver? You think they can remember the six digits if they are drunk and we catch them? No, 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 we need a practical solution for that. And they came up with a card access number. That's the number you need with the police terminal to unlock and override the user pin. So with this six digit pin, uh, pin number, even if you are driving drunken and you can't remember your six digit pin to unlock your public part of your electronic ID card, a police officer can just enter the six digits number in his handheld terminal and get all your personal information out. Interesting, isn't it? And by the way, at the moment, uh, police lost about 50 of these terminals. <laughs> Your police cars crash from time to time. Someone is even stealing police cars. They leave the key, key readers in and so on. But this is 100% secure because the police has it. Um, 
the new idea is the German government wants to use a uh, advertise on a German website pro uh, web website provider to use the EID card for age verification, ID verification, online flight booking, opening bank accounts online, um, can be used for e-government, e-banking, e-commerce, electronic signature has actually notary power. So even you can sell or buy a house by this card remotely. And some non-government functions are secured with a pin and poke, very, very similar to your SIM and smart cards on a mobile phone. Let's have a look what's stored and what's storable on this electronic documents. So you have, it's called LDS, Logical Data Structure. Everyone else will call it directory, but they call it LDS. And the LDS is using data groups. So you see, it's all by committee and they don't need to agree on common words from the IT world. They're just reinventing the wheel on everything, even on encoding. And I will come later to this. So they don't know how to do it correctly, so they call it logical data structure and every file is stored as a data group. What everyone else calls file is a data group. We have a couple of data groups. Data group one holds a machine readable zone. That's the information that's printed on the machine readable side of your ID card or passport and that's mandatory. Data group two implements a portrait image and biometric templates that's mandatory as well. So with data group one and data group two, you can enter Germany, you can enter United Kingdom, you can travel and you can use all these automatic things. Data group three to 16 are actual optional, like fingerprint, iris image. Then you have something, it's called the EFSOT. That's a security object data. And that's a cryptographic signature over these data groups. And then you have a non-signed file it's called EF.com, and that's something like the fat table of this file system, a uh, list of all existing data groups. Unfortunately, they forgot to sign the EF.com. This means all security features they put later on are optional, and the file that's telling you how many security features are in your electronic document is not secured against manipulation. All the data is called BER encoded, like ASN1, but not ASN1. And the data group 2 to 4 using CBEFF. That's a format from the biometric industry, stands for Common Biometric Exchange Format Framework, and it's ISO 19785. And who the hell is using this format? Because they defined that the data group already defined the format and then they're encoding the data with another meta format with another encoding telling you this is the iris image so at the data group 3 where your fingerprint is stored it's not the fingerprint image no it's a fingerprint image with an additional encapsulation format it's like an encoding inside an encoding just to make it easier to exploit or complicated to implement and we have interesting features in the standard, like um, we have um, another data group telling security data features, additional. We have additional personal details, like address and phone. We have optional details, anything that could be, could, could be put on an electronic document. Data for protection of the secondary biometric data. And we have the person to notify if something goes wrong. These are all optional. As I told, just data group one and data group two are mandatory. The rest are optional security features. The next feature they came up, it's called a random UID for each activation. Normally all ISO 14443 transponders has a fixed serial number. It means with a fixed serial number, um, it's used for anti-collision if you want to re do bulk reading and to prevent uh, that you got collisions on reading and selecting the things. But unfortunately with a sick fixed serial number on the metadata it means you are very very easy to track. Very easy to track. 
So if you walk through a door, I can read out the ID of your passport, even if I can't read the data. So they said, okay, we have to do something. We have to pr protect it. So some countries generate now random serial numbers. For each activation, they generate a random serial number. This means, on the other hand, you can't protect the passport uh, from bulk reading. So bulk reading is no longer possible because of the random serial numbers. But that's not required by the ICAO. Some countries like Belgium doesn't have this feature. The next feature, and that's mandatory for all passports, it's called passive identification. That's a method that proves that the passport files are signed by the issuing country. For that reason, the inspection system has to verify the hash of the data groups. The EFSOT contains the individual signature for each data group. And the EFSOT is signed by itself from the document PKI from the signing country. Um, the problem is the document signing pa uh, country needs to be stored on a passport. This means the issuer certificate needs to be stored on a passport to verify the issuer certificate. Because the reason for that was told to me from a politician, yeah, the problem is this is the first time we need interoperability between countries. And there are some problems, like Iran and Israel, both of them use electronic documents, but they can't interchange letters. How can they interchange their root certificates? On the other hand, the ICAO don't want to put their own PKI on, so they came up on a solution by committee. Every country has to upgrade and run your own PKI. Um, unfortunately, it's quite easy to set up a PKI these days. You take a Microsoft domain controller, install the PKI feature, and then you have a PKI. Oh, damn, we have to enter an email address for the root certificate. Oh, just use a Hotmail address. That's happened with some countries in Africa. So one country was just using a Hotmail address as root certificate for their passport PKI. And it's even not issued to them. So a well-known hacker actually acquired for an African country the Hotmail address for the root certificate for all passports from this country. Next time, you think that's secure? Passport on monitor? No, it's not secure. So what's happened here? The next algorithm to protect the user is actually they're using an algorithm called basic access control. The basic access control is generating from the machine readable zone, so from the printed document number, a key to read your data. It means everyone who knows your, your date of birth and your document number can actually read from remote your passport. And that's why I'm really, really upset with the organization here. They require to put in the date of birth and they require to put in your document number. And who of you actually puts the right data in? No one? I guess it's opposite. Who of you actually put fake data in? Okay, just three. I'm, I'm with you, guys. So that's the danger of electronic documents. Because this information are stored many times in hotels, rental cars, airport check-in desk, shops, cell phones, and that's the access key for your biometric data on your electronic passport. And this data are stored on many, many private databases. Um, we will skip this, if that's not interesting. Let's have a quote for the basic access control key space. So effective key space for an electronic passport is 35 bits. That's the best case. German key space is 33.3 bits, Netherlands 32.2 bits, and that's 200 times weaker than the exportable encryption functions from the US 1990. Or to compare it, it's about 15 million times weaker than the desk key that were ruled out by European court to be insecure in 1984. And by the way, the issuing date for a passport is 10 years. It means the involvement and development of security and speed of computers can't be increased into the next 10 years because the weakness of the key space will be the same 
you keep your passport for 10 days, uh, 10 years, and don't go in, okay, there's a new crack attack against this or against this one, or oh, can you please upgrade my security? It's not working. Um, we will skip this, that's not interesting. Um, so, PKI integration. I told you already um, that e thing. And the problem is, we got a couple of interesting government response after we first cloned the passport. The first one was from the original government salesman. They can't imagine that a criminal will target German ID's speciality. The next one is very interesting. A personal firewall and a state-of-the-art virus scanner should be efficient against any Trojana attack. Or an attack against banking system is more likely than one against the German EID. Um, EID, by the way, could be o used to open bank accounts via internet. <laughs> and the government um, application for e-passport is secure and well. And the signature is always good as a physical signature. German government will promote the ID as for offline and online government use, like to file a tax return. So let's do some scenarios. Security lives from scenarios. The first scenario is the Trojan can misuse the EID to open a false bank account. Second scenario, a criminal can obtain control over the PC and the user's EID. That was the way it was proven by the CCC uh, one year ago. Uh, use a false bank account under the uh, account names and use this bank account for the Nigerian uh, traffic and for um, yeah, malicious things. The second thing is obtain false document. Like a Trojan can misuse the EID to obtain document requests from the government, like false documents to get a real fake ID, like driver's license and so on. Misuse the ID for criminal activity and EID holder will be the prime suspect. The third one, and that's a um, nasty one, it, I call it malicious tax return. So the Trojan can misuse the EID to file a false tax return. Government will see this as felony and provide false tax return. This will ruin the EID holders and push them into a criminal investigation. So how to make your own passport? First, you need to say, uh, create a self-signed uh, certification authority. That's possible to generate a new key pair, put the public key into the data group 15, and use a private key to sign the documents. All you need for that is available on this URL. The second, why you want to clone a passport? Why you want to generate your own passport? Of course, I want to exploit it. First, normal text are read only. What you can do is you clone the tech, you deactivate the original tech in your passport, and now the clone tech behaves like a genuine e-passport. The next thing, you put some exploits on it. And then the exploit can attack the inspection system, backend or database. So we have an evil passport. And the evil passport is able to alter the data and writing it into an emulator ship. Not only fake biometric data could be injected, but also malicious code after inspection system and automated immigration system. Um, that's so let's have a look on the inspection system. Inspection system should be evaluated too, but they use JPEG 2000. Unfortunately, JPEG 2000 is very complicated, easy to exploit. Uh, we have a couple of exploits here. That's, by the way, the vendor's design of an inspection system designed for Microsoft Windows XP. So they use off-the-shelf PC. The RFID reader is designed to work with XP. There is no security improvement into the software, and it's like sticking a USB stick into an inspection system. So just remember, the next time you enter the European Union, you will ask the officer in line, oh, sir, do you mind, before you read my passport, to stick this USB stick into your computer and click twice on it? And then you do the inspection? I don't think he will do it. But he can do the same thing if you use a malicious tech. One of the problems we see is with the procedure. So first, all the data gets evaluated, and after the data is evaluated, it gets proved and inspected. I compare it if you go to an ATM to a cash machine. First, you could put your card in. After you put your card in, you will get the cash. And after the inspections or the ATM is cashing out you the money, you can put optional for verification your PIN code in. That's how the design of an electronic passport inspection is. Security is optional. First put the data in, second get the cash, and then PIN code is optional. So, 
Now what we want to do, we want to expect the inspection system. So the attacker or auditor can use a free implementation of a Java card to exploit inspection system. Under this URL, you can download your own electronic passport implementation for a Java card RFID dual interface controller. And after you got it, you can put some exploits in. I don't want to go about exploiting and vulnerabilities. Um, just to give you some implementation, you need shellcode, of course. And then you have a rogue MRTD. Just imagine you're coming back to Europe. First, it's just a tourist coming back from his favorite vacation in Turkey or Spain or somewhere else. Then you have three terrorists, three Al-Qaeda terrorists. They want to enter the country to do something evil. And then you have two travelers. They just came back from the vacation. With the rogue MRTD, first one gets inspected, everything happens. Second one has a special electronic passport with a exploit with malicious code inside the passport. This one is telling the inspection system, okay, ignore the automatic inspection on the next two travelers and just let them in. And after you let the next two travelers in, that's actually the complexes, the, the, the friends from the terrorist, everyone else will let out. So if the grandma comes back from the vacation, from the sunny south, they will get blocked and hold, no state, madam, you can't enter. Your passport is not correct. So they will spend all the time on grandma and the three terrorists are already inside the country. And, you know, exploits made easy. They are toolkits for doing exploits. They are toolkits to put it in. So everything you do is you can use Metasploit, generate a payload, put the payload with an exploit into your GIF image, into your GIF image, put it on a passport, and that's it. Enroll it and you're in. And not only in inside the government system, you are in the country. Conclusion. Electronic passports and EIDs are highly complex and very, in, very complicated to secure. The problem is ICAO and issuer missed the basic IT security rules. Keep it stupid and simple. And you have to see a machine-readable travel document as a USB stick with potential high dangerous contact. And an internal inspection system like the US is using is much more secure than putting all the data to verify against a person on into the hand of this person and verify and pen test all this stuff. Security approach, once again, do not trust any input, validate all input, and just filter good and bad. And that's it. And keep in mind, high tech is not meaning high security. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Some questions? We have a lot of time for questions, so. Now, if you don't want to eat, then we have a lot of time. Yeah. Well, um, you say um, the passport is not valuable and it's... I can't hear it. The passport is not useful, it's not valuable. You can trust the passport. <laughs> can you speak up or I will repeat the question then for the um, audience? You, um, you said it is... <laughs> okay, better. <laughs> um, you said the passport is not valuable. You can trust the passport. Um, isn't it a good thing um, that it is useless? No, no, actually the passport is lowering the existing security and that's not a good thing. Because I suspect in a couple of years, if some criminals get all the skills, you can buy a fake entry card into Germany, in Russia, or in some areas from persons that you don't want to have into your country. And if you have more and more automated inspection system, it will attract more and more um, person you, you originally don't want into your country. So it's not a risk for the original citizens. It's an additional risk for all citizens that some criminals will exploit these weaknesses just to enter the country. So, who is next? Questions? Over there. Just keep it close. Sure. Hello? All right. Uh, 
So I work with several uh, UN agencies and the Gates Foundation on global health needs. And one of the biggest challenges for a lot of African countries in particular is that they have no unique ID system for their citizens. So that when you, if you have to evacuate one part of your country and go to another part of your country, there's no way for you to move your medical records. You have to start from scratch. Um, we've seen a lot of proposals for NFC and RFID ID card systems. Uh, you just scared the living daylights out of me, out of that sort of a model. So for countries like this, where resources are low, technical staffing is low, what do you recommend? Uh, do it like India. Use a unique number. Assign every citizen just a unique number and make a central database with all these numbers uh, regarding to the citizen and to the actual marriage standard. But do it, do it really simple. Keep it stupid and simple. If you build a simple system, India had all this huge uh, discussion about uh, every Indian citizen should get a unique number and the national ID. It's a huge project, still running. Uh, you may know this project. And at the first beginning, all this all the sales oriented industries pushing for NFC technologies just to make money out of it are trying to make it as complicated as possible. And as, as soon as I told it, keep it stupid and simple. Use a simple number like a barcode or like an ID card and assign every citizen one unique sing, uh, single number uh, for just government use and don't use this number like the US social security number for other purposes like bank accounts because if you use this number in private and in public sector uh, you always put a demand on criminals to exploit this number like the whole US scam with social security numbers fake bank accounts uh, false uh, uh, identity theft and stuff like that so just a single number only for health and government use good advice any more questions Hi. Uh, Hi. You said uh, with this Indian um, card uh, you have a, a single unique number, but then you have this tracking issues again. You, you said before it is a problem. No, it's, it's not on an NFC ship. It's just a number. Okay, you, it's you just have to a read number it. on a piece of paper. Okay, thanks. Old school. Old school. <laughs> okay. Okay. It looks like uh, we come to an end for this session. Thank you very much, Lucas. Will you provide your slides? Um, they are already online. We have a whole website dealing with uh, NFID and RFID. Uh, it's called mrtdanalysis.org. MRTD for Machine Readable Travel Document Analysis. And for instance, we have a very, very interesting thing. So the ICAO has a whole working group and the chairman of the working group was putting an article against myself. Very funny article. And we have an open letter to this chairman of the ICAO group. And he actually, very funny to read, mrtdanalysis.org. Okay, thank you and enjoy your dinner. Thank you, Lucas. So now we make a... We're going to make a little break so you can uh, get something in your stomach. We keep on going on at 8 p.m. We have two sessions. One is uh, called Evolution of the Network. It starts at 8. It's with Daniel Reusche and Dimitri Kleiner. Should be very interesting. And the last for today is at 9. It's called Open Bank Project. Should be also very interesting. So see you here at 8 p.m.